Ryan, let me tell you about my kids' rabbits. Good, I was hoping that you would. <laughs> you've been waiting, you've been I've, waiting. Five you know years we've been doing this podcast. We've, we've done, and I, I've yet to hear a rabbit story. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I've been patient, Colin. Let me pull one out of the hat for you. Oh, oh very nice. <laughs> There. Well, that's it, folks. We will talk to you next week. We've uh, we've peaked for this week. There will be yeah, nothing all, better than that joke. That it. It's all downhill from now on. Yeah. <laughs> so this is so today we're going to talk a bit about leadership. Okay, cool. we're talking about the five rules guaranteed to make you an effective leader. Um, and uh, leadership's one of my favourite subjects, and uh, and I always remember. Um, when I first wrote my first book, Building Great Customer Experiences, back in um, uh, back in two thousand and two, um, I went to see the CEO of Pretta Mange, who are a big um, sandwich fast food mm-hmm. sandwich high end sandwich company in England, and and I we I was talking to him about customer experience stuff, and one of the things he said was. Um, uh, you know, I said, what's the most important thing in customer experience? And one of the things he said was leadership. And I thought, bloody hell, yeah, he's totally right. So let me tell you about my kids' rabbits, all right? Um, because I think this highlights some of the, the things about... It makes me nervous that you're talking about rabbits and then sandwiches <laughs> on the same example. I, I'm going to give you a little bit of, of rope here, Colin, but please do not... I'm is, nervous about where this sandwich is going. Or this is, is a little bit of rope to catch the rabbits, or maybe, or what? maybe, and, or to pull them out of the hat, or maybe to constrain what? you. As it be. <laughs> go ahead, tell me your rabbit story. I'm, I'm less excited about it than I was two minutes ago, but go ahead. <laughs> so, um, when my when my kids were kids, uh, I young, we used to have rabbits mm-hmm. in the garden, okay, uh, and they used to keep them in this rabbit hutch. Mm-hmm. Um, and we used to occasionally we used to let them out the rabbit hutch okay and the first time I ever did it I thought to myself I'm going to get the, these the rabbits out the rabbit hutch and as soon as I drop them on the floor or not drop them on the floor place them on the floor um, so you let them out of the hutch and into the house no around the garden around the garden okay, Got it. okay. just around the garden all right um, but but the point is they've been in this hutch. Yeah. So take them out the hutch, put them on the floor, and I thought as soon as I drop them on the floor, let them go. They're going to go, woohoo, and they're going to hurtle around the bloody garden. And the sure. thing, the problem I'm going to have is just catching the bloody things, right? Yeah. Uh, but the kids wanted to play with them and everything else. And the really interesting thing for me was that Rabbit, when I put, by the way, famous for shouting woohoo. Um, famous <laughs> yeah go ahead especially when being pulled out of hats exactly um but so w- the, i always remember i put them on these rabbits on the floor and i and I'm thinking they were going to go r- running around the garden and the really interesting thing was they didn't what they did was they went back in, into the hutch okay and i remember sitting there and sort of thinking about this afterwards and i was thinking you know what and this was at a time that I'd just taken over a call center team um, in Bristol in England. And I remember thinking, these rabbits are exactly like the team that I have. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the point I'm trying to get to is the hutch was all the constraints yeah. that culturally had been built up. Okay. And and they were the the team at the time that I I just taken over this this team. They didn't want to do anything more than you know uh, wake up in the morning, go to work, do the job as they've been told to, keep under the constraints they've got, not not actually do anything very much more for customers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I was trying to encourage them to get involved more, go out, you know. Um, think about, and I put a program together called Releasing Your Potential, you know, get much more involved. But it was really difficult. And this was one of the times I really started to recognize the effect of bad leadership and then hopefully converting that to good leadership because the previous 
leader had really put in a lot of the constraints and built this effectively built this rabbit hutch um so there you go that's my story about rabbits what, uh, that's what a good think? story i before we deconstruct it, I, I mean, I should point out that those rabbits are my spirit animal, like going back <laughs> inside, going back in the house. Like, yeah. I remember yeah. a comedian who said once, why would you possibly go big if you could, could just go home? Like that's, that's clearly the better option. Uh, but no, this is, this is right. A change is, I mean, if, if I were to summarize my takeaway from that story, change is difficult, right? And yes. people can get very comfortable where they're at, even if there is an opportunity elsewhere, um, it can yeah. be very comfortable where you're at. There, there are, and 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 I sort of highlight it gets very deep, really, because you can you can talk about this for a lot, uh, and we're certainly going to talk about it for the next half an hour. Um, but um, there are some people that just don't want to go running around. They don't want yeah. to say woohoo and go running around, and there's some people that are cap- not capable of doing that. But that still comes back to this, you know, how do you become an effective leader? So yeah. I've been doing leadership for many years now, and I know you have as as well. So here are five rules guaranteed to make you a more effective leader. Okay. Great. So rule number one, and this is this is a bit of a strange one, um, but again, I, I personally learned this years ago, which is rule number one is to understand yourself. Yeah. Um, and I years ago, I uh, when I first started in management, um, they I was sent on a one of these 360 degree training events. Have you ever been on one of those things where oh. people give you feedback on? So effectively, you get feedback from your team about how you're performing and the good things and the not so good things. And I'm picturing you standing else. surrounded by people who are yelling at you. Is that not? Um, no, well, okay. yelling at me, not verbally, but uh, on, uh, on pieces of paper, basically. <laughs> but is yeah. it coming at you from all directions at once, which is what Well, no, it's not coming at okay. So 360 degree feedback was basically the all concept. All positive of, and all negative and everything. Yeah, yeah, and you're getting it from different areas. So Got it. A, a lot of organizations do this with employee surveys now. So it's not just about the team that you are leading but it's from your peers it's from your bosses etc so the the 360 is a sort of a rounded feedback if you like and the interesting thing for me and the reason i mention this now is that the real bit big bit of learning for me was i thought i was projecting myself one way but it was actually being received yeah. in a different way you know um and uh, so I always remember one of the things that happened was uh, I was I decided that because I was running a team that was to do with training at the time, I thought that I should um, run a training course to understand how my the problems that my team have. The interesting bit was my team thought that I was running a, wanted to do that to get a promotion that was in the offering mm. okay and i what I, the biggest thing i learned there then was how you think you are coming across yeah and how you actually come across can be very different and can the signals that you think you are giving consciously and subconsciously can be very different to the signals that are being received and even within the same team, people can have different perceptions of of what you're doing and and saying. So the key thing for me is you need to understand how you come across to be an effective leader. Otherwise, you don't realize the imp- imp- impact that you are having. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll add to that that, you know, this advice to understand yourself there are different leadership styles right i'll yep. i'll take it into a slightly different domain uh which is teaching which is what i understand um you know i bring a certain skill set uh to the classroom when i teach yep. and i think that i i'm effective in doing that if i were forced to teach in a way that emphasized somebody else's skill set 
I have no question at all it would be terrible. I think it would be a terrible sure. experience for me. I think it would be a terrible experience for students. And likewise, I'm, I'm working with a colleague right now to um, you know, improve uh, their teaching uh, scores and, and make it um, better for them. I'm n at no point encouraging this colleague to teach more like I do. Um, sure. Because we just we're very different. But this colleague has a set of strengths that I'm convinced can be drawn out of them in the classroom to make it uh, better all around. So know yourself, I think, is really, really important. <laughs> really, really important. Yes. And know yeah. where your strengths are and, and know that you you may not be Tony Robbins. And so trying sure. to lead in a highly charismatic and um, energetic manner might just exhaust you and turn off all of your employees. Um, instead, yeah. know you and know what your strengths are and how you can leverage those to be an effective leader. Yes, and 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 uh, that's well said, um, and, and a really good good example, and and I think actually ties into the second one. Yeah. Okay. Um, which is the other thing that I've learned is, and one of the five rules for me is number two, which is be humble. Yes. So one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make is they think because they're the manager or the leader, that they are the cleverest person yeah. around. Yeah. Uh, and that's, in my view, a, a big mistake. Um, and, you know, the way that I always talk, uh, I always acted um, was that everyone, everyone has a job. Yeah. I just have a different type of job. So, you know, everyone's equal. Um, and I'm not superior to anybody else. Um, it's just that I do, I've got a particular type of job and my job is to, to, to lead the organization. Um, so it, it, it's then, I guess it forms into respect, doesn't it? Is respecting everybody in the, in those different circumstances. I think respect is a good way of framing that. Like it, you're not advocating for eliminating all hierarchy or structure, no. Uh, you know, and they're, you know, organizations fall apart when there's not a chain of command, when there's there's sure. not oversight. So, sure. but there is a humble way of doing that. And there yeah. is a non-humble way. And, and going back to your point about how things are, are perceived by other people, I think a lot of people who are not humble in leadership think that they're coming across as strong. Yeah. Um, when the reality is for most people under those leaders, they are not coming across as strong. They're coming across as weak and fragile. Yes, um, that's right. So I agree. Being defensive, refusing to take feedback, f insisting that, you know, continue to remind people of the power that you have over them. None of these things are going to make you a good leader. They're, no, they're and, and, it, and, and it builds up resentment. In yes. Media. Yes. Yeah, uh, you know, it built absolutely builds up resentment. Um, and, you know, for me, some of the phrases that I think are key is, it, is you know, it's like do as you would be done by. Yeah. So uh, I've always been a, and, and under this sort of be humble piece, I've always been of the opinion that I would never ask anybody to do anything that I wasn't prepared to do myself. Yeah. You know, so I mean, I, I'm not going to, sorry, go on. Yeah, go on. Um, so my, my brother in law works um, at a, He's a, a, has a master's in, in mechanical engineering, really smart guy, and he's in management at a, a facility that uh, uh, makes construction equipment. Right. Um, and uh, there was um, an issue, I won't get too graphic about this, but there was a, a restroom somewhere in the facility um, that uh, needed to be cleaned. Something unfortunate happened in there and, and it needed to be taken care of. Um, and there was some kind of like, interesting squabble about whose ultimate responsibility it should be. And like, it was just, it was turning into this whole like problem when it should have just been done. And so he, um, he said, all right, well, if, if the, the sub managers under him, he said, well, if you guys cannot work this out, then I will do it. And he got a hazmat suit on. Okay. Um, wow. <laughs> like it was apparently a problem. Uh, sure. he, he got this Tyvek suit on and as soon as he did, all the managers like underneath him fell into place and they're like, oh, no, no, we'll, we'll take care of it. And he said, no, sure. 
you had the opportunity to do this. I'm going to sure. do it. And yeah. it was never a problem again. Like they were no. so embarrassed that sure. they could not take care of this problem. Sure. But I thought that it was a, a beautifully well, that, humble way to do this. Like, and that I, is I, true leadership, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It and it, yeah. He, he led by example and yes. showed that this was this didn't need to be a problem that needed to be escalated. Um, yes. And then if you want to, you know, show people how to do stuff, sometimes you have to roll up your sleeves and or get on longer yeah. sleeves, as the case may be. And, but you um, see, that's a good like, example of also thinking about not just the immediate problem, yes, but the example that you are setting, yes, for other other issues, yeah, and you know because again, if I've I've looked down my list of things to mention here, you know, consensus rather than dictatorial. No. So it would have been very easy for him at that at some point Absolutely. to go. I've had enough of this, but you yep. go and do that. You know, mm -hmm. because that's what they probably wanted him to do. Yeah. Know, is to pick someone. But wouldn't have been very happy. And everybody would also be going, Well, yeah, and you would do that at the end or whatever and else. I'm but yell at you over it, it and I'm gonna humiliate yeah. and shame people who weren't and he he did none of that. I thought, I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, and, and therefore I think in that humble part, I have to say one of the things that I struggle with is um, but this goes back to knowing yourself is the consensus thing yeah. because there are times when I think to myself for Christ's sake let's just make a bloody decision and get on with this you know um, but then that's the bit about understanding myself because I then have to go back and go no Colin don't don't let that annoyance come out no. um, I have to say a lot of people also know that that's happening yeah. um, and can read if they know you well enough but, and, um, and I mean, and there are times when consensus can be formed through a, a leader kind of, I don't want to say imposing because that's the wrong word, but a leader pointing a direction and saying, nope, the organization yeah, yeah, is moving no. in this direction and we all need to get on board. But yeah, to, the, to your point, like there are humble ways of doing that. And then there are dictatorial ways of doing that. Have you ever heard of situational leadership, Ken Blanchard? No. So I've always thought that this is really good, really powerful, um, uh, really powerful model. So Ken Blanchard basically talks about, we'll put a link in the show notes, his book called The One Minute Manager. It's an old book, but um, it still stands the test of time. And basically what he talks about is the readiness of the follower. Mm. Okay. So how ready is the follower to follow you? And he basically then, four box model, and he basically then said um, that there are people that you, who are new. So let me give you an example. Um, so th there's telling, selling, participative, and delegate. So a new teacher starting to, you know, new professor, never taught, taught before, the way that you lead them is you have to tell them things. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is how you do it. This is what you do. When you, you know, you turn up here at nine o'clock, you use this, your, the leadership style you're adopting is telling. Mm -hmm. Okay. As they mature and they become more competent, you get into the selling style. So here's what I think you should do. You need to consider the fact this, and why don't you think about that? And why don't you more think persuasive? About yeah. You then get into the participative style, which is, hey, um, you know, that was that was really great. M maybe come and see me once a week and let's just have a chat about mm -hmm. the, you know, the good things and the bad things that have happened this week. Kind so of incorporating it's them more into the decision making. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they're yeah. participating yeah. in that. And the last one is delegation, which is mm -hmm. you go, I don't need to, you, know, you do what you think is the right yeah. thing. I'll stand by whatever decision that you make, you know, um, uh, yeah, you know, so you're now delegating. So, so telling, selling, uh, participative and, uh, delegating. And it's those okay. four styles depending upon, and this goes back to what we were just talking about, depending upon the circumstances. So I wouldn't tell you how to run a, to, to, deal with a lecture okay i probably would tell you how to play soccer mm. i don't know actually 
I presume you've never played. Uh, I know I played when I was a kid, but good luck because okay. uh, I'm not running that much. <laughs> you can tell me in the abstract. <laughs> yeah, but you get the idea. It's, yeah, absolutely. You've got, to, you've got to understand where those followers are. So, so be humble. Um, yes. Let me just check down my list to see if there's anything else. So, part of that for me is also no one's a second class citizen. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's consensus, um, and it's you know don't do anything you wouldn't do. So. For instance, I always sat in a um, uh, an open plan office, and it's those small things that I think are important. Third, third area, and this is actually the title of. Um, so we do a, I do a newsletter. I think you're aware every week on LinkedIn. Um, it's called Why Customers Buy. Uh, Seventy thousand subscribers. So if you want to subscribe, then um, hopefully it's useful. Uh, and within that, we have this a section that I call <clears throat> none of us are as clever as all of us. And that for me is the is the third rule. None of us are as clever as all of us. And it, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, actually, which is that don't think just because you've got the title of leader or manager, that makes you the cleverest person because it doesn't. Yeah. And in fact, once you become confident as a leader, the best thing you can do is to fill your team with people that are cleverer than you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because that's when you really can start motoring is if you've got a team of people that are a team, but are cleverer than, than you, I think that becomes really important, but the yeah. challenge is, and again, I've suffered from this over the years, um, but got to a good place with it is you have got to be comfortable letting go. Yeah, you've got to be. So when we talked about those four styles, telling, selling, participative, delegating, delegating can be a challenge because you're effectively letting someone make the choices and they don't. And the the interesting bit as well, is they will never, ever make the same choices that you make. Um, but actually, it's a bit like your kids as well, isn't it? Where, you know, they're walking and you know that they're just about to fall over. But you let them fall over uh, or make a mistake because you know that they're also going to learn from that. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, It it ties in very closely with number two, being humble um, to acknowledge that they're, you know, uh, collectively uh, you're going to be out, out thought. (laughs) Again, there's another parallel to teaching. Um, It's very common for new teachers to feel a little insecure um, especially if they're teaching yeah. in a college setting, um, because students will challenge you and you'll see, uh, I don't want to say bad teachers, inexperienced teachers, uh, get real defensive about that. And like, no, yeah. I am the expert here. And, um, so one bit of advice that is given frequently to new teachers is, um, you know, you are the expert. Uh, in, embodied in a single person. But if you think that you are smarter collectively than the classroom, you're headed for some bad times. And so, yeah. you know, are you going to solicit that? I mean, my favorite times as a teacher are when, you know, we have these rollicking discussions and everyone's contributing and we're able to like, yeah. them. and, um, and to give you Colin personal credit for this, like I've, I've seen you embody this in uh, your, your company. Right. So when I've had engagements with beyond philosophy, I've been in meetings and on email exchanges and you use this, this phrase frequently. Um, where you're soliciting sure. brainstorming and feedback and and thoughts and um, sure. you, know, you 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 try to squeeze the uh, the organization for all the insights that you can. It's very clear that you believe this. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. I think it's I think it's 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 vital. Yeah. Um, the the other phrase I learned, which sort of ties into this, is that leadership emerges from anywhere. So again just because you're the boss doesn't mean to say that you have to be the leader. So there are many times where you actually have to take a step back and go in this circumstance, this person in your team knows far more about this subject than you do. So you should become subordinate to that individual and you, they should tell you what to do, you know, um, because they know far more about it. And, you know, maybe it's, you go back to that Ken Blanchard model Maybe they need to be participative with you because you don't know as much about it as, as you should do. 
So yeah, and recognizing that is not a threat to your leadership, but as a, a a way of strengthening your leadership if you're able to kind of co-opt that and yeah, to strengthen the organization and that you're leading. Yeah. And I think the other thing for me, because we haven't really sort of related this back to rabbits, have we? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's actually the primary feedback we get uh, when people review the podcast. It's like, where where's the tie-in to rabbits? Where's the tie-in to rabbits? Yeah. So let me pull another one out of the hat for you. Um, the joke hit think... less well the second time. I'm just gonna you. It was really good the first time. I've overworked it now. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take that feedback. Thank you. We, we need another uh, rabbit now. But I think the issue for me is that in that environment where the people were rabbits, okay, because of the poor leadership that happened before, nobody would stand up and lead the organization. Yeah. Nobody was contributing. Yeah. In fact, one of the other things that was key here was nobody wanted to do anything that was new. Yeah. Because if they came up with a suggestion of how to improve something, Basically, what happened was that they, um, if they, 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 they knew that if they failed, their boss would have a go at them. Yeah. So you've got to create that environment where failure is okay. Yeah? yeah. And if you don't create that environment where failure is okay, then again, it's a it's an issue to say the least. Okay. Um, conscious of time. So let me rattle on to a couple of other ones. Great. Um, number five: communicate. Again, sounds really simple, but the amount of people that I see that fail to communicate. So, and and the key here is frequency, yeah. open and honest and transparent. And if there's bad news to give them, give them it sooner rather than later. Um, and, you know, something I, I talk to the team about is... Just think to yourself when you're communicating, who do I need to tell about this? Because I would rather over communicate than under communicate um, and, and then think about how that message is, is being received. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a ton to add on that. I just, um, management can sometimes treat information as, a precious commodity and yeah, yeah. part of how we're going to maintain control over our subordinates is by withholding information and only giving them what we feel they need and only in the form that we want them to get it. And that is sure. a real short-term strategy. Like that's, yeah. that's going to be no, absolutely. damaging. Yeah. And I think the other part of that communication is about accessibility. Yeah. So yeah, it has to be both ways, both directions. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but also just physical things. But so again, old management concept, you know, management by wandering around. So yeah. just by wand wandering around the office or wandering around or making sure that you're going and spending time in the field with people and just being open to communicate uh, with them. Yeah. Um, there's, there's another Ken Blanchard book. I don't know if I've told you about uh, the one minute. I, I think I'm have one minute manager meets the monkey. Yes. I've just bought my my daughter's partner. I've just bought this book for him um, because it talks about um, it talks about how how problems can, problems effectively they call Blanchard calls um, it monkey management. So monkeys are problems, mm -hmm. and and the reason I'm raising it here is because your team can communicate to you monkeys problems. Mm -hmm. And then the issue again is how do you deal with those those problems uh, and who deals with them? So, I mean, that sounds like a great book. I just finished one called The One Minute Manager Meets a Rabbit. Um, <laughs> a little bit different. Yeah. What happened at the end? Um, I... <laughs> <laughs> or haven't you got to the end yet? <laughs> last one uh, is, and this is again a critical one, and actually the irony of this last one is it should be a byproduct of doing all of the other things. Yes. Uh, and the last one is, is build loyalty. So um, loyalty, you know, is, is not, some people expect loyalty, but loyalty is not 
something that you can just expect. You have to earn it, basically. Yeah. Um, and loyalty is, uh, you know, you need to be able to protect your team. You need and show that you're protecting your team. You need to be part of the team. Your was it your brother-in-law was a, a yeah. classic example of that. You need to care for your team at a personal level, uh, in, in my view. You need to get to know them, not just in a business context. But, you know, I've always thought that, you know, typically you've got two lives. You've got your business life and you've got your personal life. And whilst I wouldn't want to personally intrude with anybody, I do feel that you should know who their partners are, you know, a, a, a bit about their home life. And if they've got a problem at home, you've got to respect that because we all get problems at home. I, re I remember one of my team, um, she was getting married and it was like three days before her, her wedding and she was running around like a headless chicken. And, and I ended up just saying, just go, just go home. You know, for the yeah. next three days off, I don't, don't have to book it as annual leave, just go, right? You know, focus on that because I knew that when she came back, yeah. her mind would be in a completely different different place um and an interesting story from the other side i had one manager um who shall remain nameless who i had a one to one to talk about my future and guess what happened he talked about his future he didn't show up oh. <laughs> which told me what he thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Take a hint, Colin. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, but an important point, you know, it, it, it speaks volumes, doesn't it? So, yeah. I mean, it, I think that a lot of bad managers misunderstand loyalty as a concept, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. A lot of people think that loyalty is you being loyal to me, right? Yeah. You, you having a commitment to me. Um, whereas as you just pointed out, I mean, you know, your, your the, the items that you just listed off, you know, protecting your team, um, caring for your team on a personal level, that has nothing to do with people being loyal to you. If your definition of loyalty is, you know, one-sided, but loyalty is reciprocal and the way yeah. that you earn loyalty, the way that you, you engender loyalty and strengthen it is by being loyal. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of firms will be like, oh, you know, you have to be loyal to the company and then we're just going to lay you off whenever it's convenient for us. Um, sure. And that, and that's like, the there's no recipe for loyalty there. And so, yeah, to, yeah. to engender loyalty, you know, lo loyalty is a two-way street. It's a reciprocal relationship, however you want to phrase it. But yeah, you, you need to be loyal if you want people to be loyal back to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let me let me go through those uh, five rules for guaranteeing to guarantee to make you an effective leader again. So number one is understand yourself. Number two is be humble. Number three is none of us are as clever as all of, all of us or recognizing that that's the case. Number four is communicate. And number five is building loyalty. I could literally spend hours talking about this subject with loads of different anecdotes about this, but it is going back to the CEO at Predamonje. It's pretty fundamental in any walk of life that you're you're in. Um, so yeah, I we mean, advice about uh, leadership multiplies like rabbits, huh? How about that one? Yeah. <laughs> is that... No. Yes. I like Maybe? I like the time. Well. It... I, I guess the only other thing I would say is that if you've got a rabbit's foot, it wasn't that lucky for the rabbit, was that's it? True. So, <laughs> so we hope that's been of use to you. Uh, and we um, make sure that you are, are being an effective leader. And we look forward to talking to you next week on the show. Cheers. See ya. <laughs>